Welcome to the Swindon Festival of Literature, or rather the virtual online Swindon Festival of Literature. Thanks everyone for joining us. We do hope that all is well where you are. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on, or at least to go on online. Now today's guest redresses a centuries old imbalance. She puts the women of the Greek myths on an equal footing with the men. And she does so in her book, Pandora's Jar, which is this book here. Let me see it. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature online welcome to broadcaster, author of six books, passionate classicist, Natalie Haynes. Hello. Natalie, welcome. Hi. Um, very nice you could join us. Have you, I mean, we're only online and we would have had you here live if it had been possible. Right. But and Swindon in spring is lovely. Have you, I, ever been, have you ever been to it? Of course. I, I cherish memories of your roundabouts. All your roundabouts and their strange, mysterious, linked line. Yeah, no, I spent 12 years on tour as a stand-up comedian, so I've been pretty well everywhere, to be honest with you, um, over the years. So I've either stormed a gig or died really badly in Swindon, but I'm afraid uh, <laughs> my memory happily is terrible, so I just can't remember which it was. But probably both over the years. Yeah, um, Swindon, Swindon, Basingstoke, Bracknell, they blur into one, maybe. Um, I've gigged many times in all of those places. I don't know what you want me to say. I mean, you know, it goes that way when you're a stand-up. No, I'm sure. Um, Rainer Maria Rilke, the German poet, said, if a place bores you, uh, look at yourself, not the place, because the three main things for life are the same wherever you are, sunshine, uh, rain, and human relationships. So... Uh, I hope you found all of that was fine when you came to Swindon. I mean, I didn't crash the car, so let's assume the rain wasn't too bad uh, or the light wasn't too dazzling. And I, I don't remember having any restraining orders out either of me or from me. So I think human interaction must have gone fine as well. I'm going to say it was a win for me, Swindon. Brilliant. Um, OK, let's get to the topic in hand, um, your book. Um, and, and before you tell us just a little bit about um, why you wrote it, um, I'd like to read a short passage from towards the end of the Penelope chapter. It goes like this. When the question arises, why retell Greek myths with women at their core? It is loaded with strange assumptions. The underpinning belief is that the women are and always have been on the margins of these stories, that the myths have always focused on the men and that women have only ever been minor figures. This involves ignoring the fact that there is no real or true version of any myth because they arise from multiple authors across multiple locations over a long period. What Pandora brings to mortals is complexity. And that is true of all the women in this book. Some have been painted as villains, Clytemnestra and Medea, some as victims, uh, Eurydice and Penelope, and some have been literally monstered, for example, Medusa but they are much more complicated than these thumbnails descriptions allow, um, is what you say. Yes, that sounds like me. That sounds like the kind of thing I would say. Um, um, what, what motivated you to, 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 to redress this balance, this imbalance? Um, I think it's one of those things where it takes you a while to notice that the way you look at something isn't always the way that other people look at something. And I was very lucky and got to study classics at school. And, um, and then I went on and did my degree in it. Um, so I guess I didn't really think about it because I'd always read um, Medea as, um, as Euripides. I didn't really think about coming at her from another direction. I didn't, come, I didn't come to her via things like opera. I came to her because she was my set text in my first year in sixth form. Um, and so you suddenly realize that people have a different idea. And actually it wasn't a Greek woman that made me realize it. It was a Phoenician woman, Dido. Um, who I knew from book four of Virgil's Aeneid, which was my A-level text. Um, and I did a Radio 3 interview, I think. And uh, in, in Virgil's Aeneid, Dido is just, a, it's, she's just extraordinary, this incredibly beautifully, sympathetically drawn portrait of a woman who falls in love in spite of her best intentions and instincts, who has gods literally conspiring to destroy her, um, and who is, overwhelmingly generous. You know, when the Trojans, led by Aeneas, the Trojan prince who escapes from Troy when it falls, um, arrive in her city, the, the city of Carthage, which she's building, 
she offers them equal standing there. She says, you know, either stay here as equal citizens. I mean, that's quite an unusual attitude to have towards refugees, which is what they are um, in the ancient world or the modern one, let's be honest. Um, she says either stay here on equal footing with the Phoenicians with whom I've, I've, I'm founding this city, or, you know, we'll give you whatever you need to kind of go on your way. She's incredibly generous. And I was doing this interview with uh, somebody on Radio 3 um, because it was pegged to a production of Dido, Queen of Carthage that the RSC were doing. And it was one of those bizarre conversations where you're completely at odds with each other, but you don't realize it for a really long time. And so his opening gambit was not quite, why is Dido so poisonous? And mine was, why are you high on drugs? Because clearly she isn't poisonous. What's wrong with you? And then, and only then did I realize that the Marlowe version of her is just hateful. You know, she's vengeful, she's poisonous. It's like, wait, what? How did that happen? And I was so kind of annoyed by it. I thought, how, how dare everyone know that version? <laughs> when they've missed out on this incredible version, this beautiful, sympathetic character. And Dido is the lead in book four of the Aeneid. She has more dialogue than Aeneas does. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how mad that an ancient author is prepared to put a woman center stage for a chunk of this poem. But you would be really hard pushed to find modern writers doing that. And by modern, obviously, I'm going right back to Elizabethan times. <laughs> I'm like all classicists. I, I, once the Roman emperor's are gone, then I, as far as I'm concerned, that's modern history. And any time after about Henry VIII is politics. So there it is. Um, but I was, uh, I was working on, on the, the idea of writing this book, I think already, but it was that Dido conversation where I just thought, this is absolute lunacy. Of course, I've got to, to write this book because people just don't know these stories the way they should be told that sparked it i mean uh and it's funny isn't it because wasn't it ever thus and isn't it still like that in other words um even though we're not dealing with greek myth we're dealing with media now and don't people still get either demonized or forgotten or, yes. or made heroes yeah i think we have a very um simplistic way of looking at people um and social media probably exacerbates that. I don't think it's caused it, but it's certainly made it more visible uh, to those of us who participate in it. Um, so I suppose that is a part of it, but it's certainly the case that we still tend to see, we want to impose a kind of easy narrative, I think, onto stories. So what we really want is a hero and a villain. And the idea that we might get in, for example, the Euripides play Hippolytus, that there there is no hero really in that play. There's, there's only vil villains and victims of their villainy. Mm. Um, and that's the version that we find in Euripides, but later versions will become much more binary. We want a hero and a villain um, and, and that's how it goes. And I thought, you know, th these stories are so interesting. When you look at somebody like Helen, who obviously, you know, has always enchanted artists and um, and writers because of this yeah, extraordinary so idea mm -hmm. of being the most beautiful woman ever to live. But to ancient authors, to Euripides, he's always giving her great dialogue. You know, she has fantastic speeches in The Women of Troy. She has fantastic speeches in um, her own play, Helen. And then by the time you get to the version that we see in Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, she's literally mute. <laughs> How's this progress? I don't understand. It's like 2,000 years of pushing women towards saying nothing at all. Good. That's what I was hoping for. Oh. So I kind of thought it seemed awful to me that, you know, even though for those who watch the Richard Burton movie, then obviously, you know, your vision of Helen of Troy is painted silver Elizabeth Taylor, not a bad thing. But, you know, Elizabeth Taylor was pretty funny and interesting too. It's like, how did how did beautiful women have to become mute or, or evil like Pandora, who isn't evil to the Greeks, but becomes evil when she gets mapped onto the Eve narrative? It's like, I, oh, give it here, I'll write it. So yeah, essentially it was a whole set of essays, um, I suppose, just wanting to say, here are some awesome stories about these women whose names you might know, but whose stories, you know, have just been forgotten. And, you know, often the, the, older the version, the more interesting the female character is, which is bonkers, because it's not like the ancient world was devoid of misogyny. It had plenty, thanks for asking. Um, but one of the variants of misogyny it doesn't necessarily exhibit in the same quantities that we have until really very recently, and I mean, within just a few years, is a sense that only men should have stories told about them. You know, I, I was going to the cinema on my own in the 90s. That's, that was my, the beginning of my cinema going career. 
and you know men had adventures and women went oh but be careful as they went out the door you know or, or occasionally in the case of the film seven i suppose uh, i don't want to spoil it for anyone but end up with their head in a box um and you go well i'd like to look at a more interesting decapitation narrative please and that would be medusa and so yeah it wasn't that difficult really once i decided that these were stories that that had got lost to to choose ones that needed to be told yeah and whether it's through uh a partial education or through modern media or whatever, isn't it actually inevitable that we take stereotypes as a kind of shorthand to knowing something about them? In other words, down at the tennis club, they'll have a notion of who Oedipus was and what went on with his mum and that's it. And it's, it, it, it's- Yes, I suppose it is. They've moved from being archetypes to stereotypes. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's true. It always makes me think of that joke in Mighty Aphrodite where Olympia Dukakis uh, plays Jocasta and she says I wonder what they're calling my son in Harlem a joke which I'm simply not going to explain for the viewers of Swindon because it is far too rude uh, but there it is um, so yes I think it's just a you know, it's like an elision you know we start out with these incredible archetypes but essentially to save time you know we end up um, boxing them up into stereotypes and the story of Oedipus is actually incredibly protean you know it, it's it's much less certain than we, a modern audience, would think because the only version that we tend to ever see or hear is the version in the Sophocles play, Oedipus the King, Oedipus Tyrannus. Um, and so I think a lot of people, not unreasonably, assume that that is the original version or the, the true one or the right one. And, and of course, there is no such thing. You know, there's an earlier narrative um, which, which dates back before Sophocles and that we can see in Homer. Um, and, and uh, references to an earlier version in Stesichorus, although um, we don't have very much of that. But that's true over and over again. You know, there's a tradition that Helen of Troy, as we think of her, never goes to Troy, but instead goes to Egypt. And it dates back as far as Homer. You know, the oldest telling of the Trojan War that we have, the Iliad, um, it, it very definitely places Helen at Troy. And yet, you know, dating back to the 8th century BCE, so not far short of 3,000 years ago, there's this alternative version where she doesn't go at all. And do you think this relative ignorance of, 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 of stories like this can be redressed by the classics and greats, as they're called in higher education, or used to be called, coming somehow back into education? And I notice you sort of move this material from Radio 3 to Radio 4, will you be on Radio 2 and Radio 1 and 6 music next? And, and will be people be clamoring for it? Because really, I mean, I don't want to flatter you or anything, but you managed to do it in some mysterious way without dumbing it down and still having all the names and all the details. And, and uh, this is a festival of literature and our slogan is life is for learning at the Swindon Festival of Literature. So there's a kind of hidden agenda that all men and women like to learn something. Um, and why do we study great literature? Why do we study this stuff, so-called great literature? And is it, is it maybe, and maybe you can answer this question, to stop us gouging our eyes out or killing other men when we're cross with them? Do, do people who, who, who study classics do less gouging and less fighting than I men I mean, don't? you have to assume that's true, don't you? Except for the fact that I would say eye gouging is probably at quite a low level now relative to teaching of Latin, I would say that probably in the UK at least, there was more Latin teaching 50 years ago, um, although obviously there are now more students because there are more humans. Oh. Um, and, and yet I, I'm, I'm not certain of the figures for eye gouging, but I'm guessing that they haven't gone up yeah. at the same rate that Latin has, has declined as a subject in the state sector. Um, I obviously hope they haven't gone up, um, but I, I, I don't have the numbers to hand. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm ill prepared for this gig. Um, yeah, I think we're, I, I mean, obviously I agree with, with that as a, as a slogan or a motto. I'm very Aristotelian in my outlook. I think we are ultimately curious. And um, I think one of the ways that we want to maintain our, our, our sense of self um, is to keep inquiring, to keep learning, to keep being interested in new things. And I am very much a, uh, I practice what I preach here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be, as I was writing the Penthesilea chapter, the Amazons chapter in Pandora's yeah. Jar, I thought, I really wish I knew more about fighting and close combat and thought, oh yeah, okay, I'll take up kickboxing. And that's not an unusual kind of mindset for me. It's like, oh, I should know more about something. I should go and learn about that. It's, you know, who doesn't want to learn about stuff? I can see the temptation to, to sort of sit within what you know, but I love finding out new things. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that doesn't mean I have a kind of a, a monopoly on having read all the, you know, all, all great literature or even all bad literature or even a combination of the above. You know, you can't, there's too much. Um, and I can't read, I can read Latin and Greek and, you know, at a push, I could read something in French. Um, but I can't read, for example, Borges in Spanish, much as I would like to, I have to read him in translation. And I know he helped with his own translations. So, you mm. know, you have a more personal relationship there. But, you know, if I read something Italian, I'm having to read it in translation and or German even more so, I'm hopeless. Um, so there's always that kind of filtering and, you know, and you, you can't possibly go for everything. So I guess the question is, do you approach things with a relatively curious and open mind? And I think if you do, classics is always going to have something for you. It's the only subject really that you can study a whole society. If you do a degree in classics, you know, you can study the literature and the politics, uh, the social history. Um, you could do archeology, span you could do art um, uh, and sculpture, you could do linguistics. Um, so you can be doing science and archeology, span you could be doing art appreciation, uh, fine arts, you could be doing um, linguistic analysis, you could be doing any of these things long before you even get to the bit of waltzing in, reading some Greek tragedies and then retelling them as novels, which obviously is what people like me tend to do. So there's a lot, there's a whole society there for you, multiple societies actually, of course. Um, and I think maybe that's probably what draws us in that sense that we're, a, a lot of us don't get to study classics at school. Um, classical civilization is doing gangbusters, um, which is fantastic. So classics in translation, essentially. Um, but the languages, Latin and Greek, are taught in decreasing numbers of schools, or there's a little upturn, I think, at the moment. So we're, we're trying to address the balance a bit. Um, but the majority of Latin and Greek language teaching is in the private sector, and that's only 7% of students. So 93% of students, which isn't to say there are no state schools teaching Latin and indeed Greek. There are a few, I think I've visited all the ones that teach Greek. Um, mm. But, you know, there are some teachers and students doing incredible work and meeting, you know, around a packed curriculum in their lunch hours and after school in order to study this stuff. Um, but it's certainly the case. It's much easier to access classics at school mm. if you're in a private school. And I, I understand how that's happened, mm. but I don't think it's OK to just say, to 93% of students, sorry, this isn't for you. It is for you. This is all our histories. Mm. This is all our history. This is all our cultural history. And it's not okay to just say, oh, well, you know, that belongs to children whose parents can pay for it. No, it doesn't. Who said? So I'm very proud that the Radio 4 series, it gets about 1.6 million listeners an episode, mm. um, which obviously is due to the BBC's total hegemony of the airwaves rather than to do with any particular program. But it went up as a podcast just over a year ago. So you can get the early episodes of Natalie Haynes Hands Up for the Classics um, online. And it's been downloaded a million times in a year, just over a million times in a year. Um, and it's really interesting when people contact me, there's an absolute generational divide pretty well that, that people who are my age um, say, I like your radio show. And people who are younger say, I like your podcast. <laughs> and so it's obviously we're finding, we're getting to different audiences in different ways. But yes, obviously, if Radio 2 decides that what they definitely need uh, sometime in the day is a, a classic slot, then I am here for them. I used to talk, I used to do Keris's show on Six Music because uh, Keris is obviously just the most glorious human oh, being. Oh. Um, and, uh, but I didn't used to talk about classics very often. But when I did, she was always, at least she always pretended to be really happy. <laughs> so let's assume she meant it. Yeah. No, and she does, she does poetry on a Sunday morning. I mean, what's not to like? It's, it's, it's Literally just, nothing. Um, I, there's nothing not to like about Keris. She's yeah. just a magnificent person. And I love your excitement and your belief in, in the role of literature. I want you to come and give a talk on it because... Um, I will. At the there festival last year, a young mechanic with dirt under his fingernails came up to me and said, can you recommend a book? I've never read one. And it was so exciting. It was unbelievable. And he's since told me that what happens is each time he reads a book, it references something that he wants to go to. So it says, as Henry Miller says, and he says, I want to, I want to check out this guy, Henry Miller. And before you know it, one thing is leading to another. It's so Absolutely. Exciting. Books are a gateway drug. Everybody's got one, you know, and they all take you to harder books <laughs> later on. Which book did you recommend? Yeah. Um, um, uh, Holes by Louis Sachar. Do you know it? He, 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 it, it was a, is it a YA book? Have I remembered that right? Yes, it, yes it, I it, think it, I have read it. A yeah. grown up can read it. And it's about there, young... there is, there are, I, I hate divisions of books. As yeah, far as I'm concerned, there are good books and yeah. bad books. Everything else is fine. 
it, it's a great book. I loved it, and I'm not, mm. I'm not a, a YA. Um, talking of books, we should really get back to this one. We're having a great time. This um, happens to me all the time. My publishers somewhere in the distance are crying. <laughs> going, just mention the book, Natalie. A Thousand Ships, the one that came before it. I got so excited talking about Homer on the tour. Like, Could you tell them you wrote a novel? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I think at one show, that they're usually an hour long when I'm in theatres. I made it to minute 58 before I to mention it. Well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, I can't help it. Homer is great. Who doesn't want to hear about him? Idiots, and I'm not here for those people. I, I'm so glad that you've acknowledged that it's your fault, not mine. It's I, absolutely I, mine. I will mayor cop for this all day long. It's 100% my fault. I'm putting it on the record. <laughs> I suddenly thought, oh my God, I, we, we, we're going astray. We haven't gone to the book and uh, Natalie and her publishers will be cross. I'm fantastic. The book. I mean, they might be. <laughs> They'll never find us. Quick, let's run. <laughs> Festival of literature this is. Um, why don't we um, have a look at, uh, you know, there are 10 women in here, but why don't we have a look at one of them who, whose other half, so to speak, is often mentioned in conversations all over the place, in pubs, uh, over dinner tables, Oedipus, everyone thinks they know. Um, and there's Jocasta, who gets slightly forgotten. Um, how about we'll make up for our diversionary chat that we've just had, um, Natalie, and go to the book. And as they say in, in academic circles, go to the text. Would you, are you okay with that? Unprepared? So here for it. So Why don't we... Uh, and, and, uh, I love that she's your favourite. This puts you in very good company with Professor Paul Cartledge, the Leventus Professor of Greek at Cambridge. Oh, the, really? I think maybe he's the Emeritus Leventus. Anyway, he's extremely well, important and he likes uh, Thebes more than any other bit. So oh, well, I had a choice of 10 and I chose this one and Natalie has agreed that, um, that we should do this one. Um, and those of you who are watching, be prepared. We're going to read to you for about eight or so minutes and we're going to share the reading. Um, <clears throat> And I'll begin. This is this is um, Oedipus and Jocasta, and this is the, the story. Um, the story of Oedipus has an archetypal and almost elemental quality, but what actually happens in that story is very much less certain than we might think. Let's start with Sophocles, since um, his is the version most likely to be known today, and look at the plot in some detail. <clears throat> the story of Oedipus covers perhaps 20 years and multiple distant loca distinct locations. The play begins with Oedipus, king of Thebes, offering to do whatever it takes to release his fellow citizens from the plague that has beset the city. A priest tells him that they need his help. After all, many years earlier, Oedipus freed the city from the Sphinx, so he is known to be good at solving problems. <coughs> Oedipus is way ahead of them. He has already sent his wife's brother Creon to Delphi to ask the oracle for advice. He's barely finished explaining this when Creon appears on stage with the news that Thebes is polluted with the plague because it is harboring the murderer of the previous ruler, King Laius. Oedipus asks where Laius died. On his way to Delphi is the answer. Set upon by thieves and killed. Why didn't you hunt down his killers at the time? asks Oedipus. The Sphinx told us to leave it, his brother-in-law replies. Right, says Oedipus. I'll solve the crime even though I wasn't there then. Tiresias, the blind seer, enters and tells Oedipus to leave well alone, implying that he, Oedipus, is himself the man he seeks, the killer of Laius. Oedipus is livid. Are you conspiring with Creon, he asks, so that he can be king? Remember how I solved the Sphinx's riddle? Do you really want to try and overthrow me? Tiresias warns him that he will regret his words and leaves muttering the terrible truth about Oedipus's parentage. Oedipus and Creon then also argue, the latter being understandably peeved to find that he has been accused of treason. It was your idea to ask Tiresias for help, Oedipus replies, and now he says I'm the killer, which I'm not because I wasn't even there, I wasn't even here then, so you must be conspiring with one another. No, Creon replies, I don't want to be king, I have plenty of power, as your brother-in-law, thanks. And then... And then at last, almost halfway through the play, Jocasta enters. She intervenes between her husband, Oedipus, and her brother, Creon, telling Oedipus that he's wrong to suspect Creon. Fine, says Oedipus. He'll probably destroy me, but by all means, let him go. 
Why are you so angry? Jocasta asks. Tiresias says I killed your first husband, Laius, Oedipus says. What do prophets know, she replies. An oracle told Laius he'd be killed by his own son, and he wasn't. He was killed by strangers, by bandits, at a place where three roads meet. And his son, our son, was exposed to death years earlier on the mountain when he was three days old. Wait, Oedipus said, did you say a place where three roads meet? What did he look like, Laius? He looked a bit like you, says Jocasta. Was he definitely attacked by bandits? Oedipus asks. Did someone say there was a survivor? Send for him. Jocasta wonders what he is frightened of. Well, Oedipus replies, you know I grew up in Corinth. A drunk man at a banquet once told me I was adopted. So I went to Delphi and asked the oracle. And she told me that I would kill my father and have sex with my mother and I'd produce incestuous offspring. To avoid this dreadful fate, I decided never to return to Corinth. And on my way out of Delphi, I met a rude old man at a place where three roads meet and we argued and I killed him. He started it, by the way. I killed his men too. And now I'm afraid that it was Laius and he and I were related and I've done something terrible. But this witness we've sent for apparently said they were attacked by a group of men, in which case that wasn't me and it's okay. I remember the witness coming back to Thebes, Jocasta says. He definitely said bandits, not one bandit, don't worry. And anyway, prophecies don't mean anything. My son was killed as a baby before he could kill Laius, remember? That's true, Oedipus says. But send for the man anyway. Jocasta leaves the stage, and when she returns, she prays to Apollo. It's a bracing change of attitude since only moments ago she was saying oracles were meaningless. Suddenly, a messenger arrives from Corinth to tell Oedipus that Polybus, the king of Corinth, and the man Oedipus believes to be his father, is dead. Jocasta and Oedipus are delighted. If Polybus is dead, then Oedipus didn't kill him. I said not to worry, says Jocasta. Everything's down to chance. You didn't kill your father, and you won't marry your mother. Loads of men dream of sleeping with their mothers. It means nothing. And at least you definitely didn't kill your father. But then... The messenger reveals that Oedipus was indeed adopted. He had no need to avoid Corinth after all. The messenger gave Oedipus to Polybus and Merope when he, Oedipus, was just a baby with his feet pinned together, hence his name. Oedipus in Greek means swollen foot. Where did you get me? asks Oedipus, horrified. From a Theban shepherd comes the answer. This turns out to be the very man who witnessed and survived the attack on Laius. Jocasta suddenly understands the truth and begs Oedipus to stop pursuing the mystery of who killed Laius and of who he is. He refuses to listen and she runs into the palace saying the only name she has for him is Wretched. The shepherd finally arrives and reluctantly confirms the messenger's story. Oedipus then sees what Jocasta has already guessed. They are not only wife and husband, but mother and son. He goes into the palace, but of course we cannot follow him. We must wait until a palace servant rushes out to say that the queen is dead by her own hand. In one of the most memorable sequences in all of theater, he then tells us that Oedipus found his wife hanged, took the brooch of pins from her dress and put out his own eyes. Now he has truly seen who he is. He cannot bear to see anything else. Blindness is the only possible response. At his own request, he is banished from the city by Creon, who assumes the throne. The play moves with an astonishing momentum. The revelations come raining down on Oedipus so quickly that we barely have time to catch our breath. In one short day, he goes from king, husband, father and son to widower, murderer, ruin, exile. An equally devastating fall from grace happens to Jocasta and yet we almost forget about her. Why? The short answer is because the role of Oedipus is um, even by the standards of Greek tragedy uh, it is unusually focal um, in that play. 
So Jocasta only has 120 lines. The play is about 1500 lines long. She only has 120 lines, so not even 10% of the whole and actually she's not even the second character the second character is creon he has the second most lines but mainly the problem is that oedipus is just the most compelling character it's an astonishing role for an actor to play um and i should say this does happen with some other plays uh aeschylus agamemnon the lead role isn't agamemnon it's clytemnestra for example uh, she has the most lines she just doesn't have the title um but it he takes up so much heat and light in this version of the story that we we just kind of lose track of everyone else around him he is it, it's a it's an astonishing the, the momentum of that play is absolutely astonishing when you watch it live or even when you tell it i i often tell the story to an audience um, and i often do it to school kids and they they don't know what happens yet you know and, and they're probably like <gasps> <laughs> just can't believe it and it's you know it's like being punched in the face over and over again you, all you can do is just keep rolling with the blows um and and because of that i think our focus gets gets a little skewed but if we go back to an earlier version um the version which we can see in book 10 i think i'm right to say of the odyssey um where odysseus goes down to the underworld to consult he's trying to consult tiresias the the very same seer that appears in this play who is now dead but that's no bar to consulting him welcome to greek myth um and so he goes down to the underworld and he has what's always described in translations when I was a child as meetings with famous women, which used to make me howl with laughter at this idea of Oedipus wandering around the underworld, introducing himself to all these women with a sort of anxious handshake. Uh, but actually what happens is that he sort of sees these famous women of Greek myth who have died. Um, and one of them is Kalen Epikasten, beautiful Epikast is what Homer calls her. Um, and he does the whole story in 10 lines. He says um, that she had uh, committed this this grave crime um, and married her son in ignorance and the gods made it known immediately and then she rushes down to Hades i.e kills herself um, leaving him behind you know I can't remember the exact phrase you know carrying all the you know baleful accusations that only a mother could or something like that but it's, it's incredibly short but it's pretty much 50 50 the way that Homer tells it the emphasis is on them both obviously slightly different version because she has a different name Epicast isn't a rogue spelling it's an actually different name but she's clearly the same person he's made, named as Oedipus and what, what else is interesting is that the gods make their incestuous marriage known immediately so they don't go on to have children there's, it, it, there's extensive ancient debate about who the mother of Oedipus's children is I think the the other candidate is a woman named Yuri Ganea I can't I can't remember um but obviously the version that we all know is the Sophocles version because it's a magnificent play you know Aristotle in the fourth century writing about Greek tragedy and his poetics had it down as the most structurally perfect play there was and you know he, he's he wasn't often wrong about he's wrong about human biology do not go to Aristotle for that he thinks you've got humors you haven't go to a doctor but in terms of um literary analysis he's pretty good yeah. and haven't there on the back of things you say and others have said been productions of the play that do somehow put Jocasta more at the forefront. In other words, you know, you think of the way, I don't know, Jean Rhys rewrote or wrote a passage, wrote- uh, God, I love White Sargasso Sea, yeah. White Sargasso Sea, and, and the woman in the attic gets gets a proper, gets a proper place. Gets her or, moment. Or, 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 or the way Macbeth has been redone so that there's a different balance between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And so have, hasn't that happened with Jocasta? It absolutely has. I mean, the earliest example we could go to is probably a play called The Phoenician Women by Euripides. So it happens about 20 years after the Oedipus Tyrannus, um, the Oedipus the King is staged for the first time in Athens. And then Euripides puts on what's basically a, a play set in the aftermath of that play, um, or that part of the story, I should say. And his version begins with a monologue from Jocasta, who has therefore, just to be clear, not died she is not in the underworld she has not hanged herself but instead we discover from this monologue when the revelation of their incestuous relationship is made then it's oedipus who is seen as being shameful and his sons who are named polynices and Eteocles, lock him up in the palace basically because they're so embarrassed by him but jocasta continues that they share the kingship between them at least for a while before civil war breaks out which is the the point where the play begins um 
and but for them Jocasta is a sort of um like a kind of queen mother character you know she's a she's obviously the mother of both kings she has this sort of diplomatic role she's trying to reason with the two of them um and, and stop them from fighting it doesn't work spoiler um but this version of her it, I mean it's just an extraordinary monologue where she talks about for example the the loss of her baby, the loss of Oedipus, which is something we just never think about in Sophocles. And there's no real reason to, you know, there are moments where she says, you know, oh, well, we lost our child when he was three days old. So what do oracles know? And we kind of go, yeah, this is a moment where you could have gone into a, a bit about this, but you're keeping the momentum going. Sophocles is just doing a different thing. It's not like he doesn't care. He writes brilliant women, but his version is doing something and Euripides is doing something else. And when Euripides takes on this story, he has Jocasta talking about the physical pain that she goes through. And she talks about the baby being taken and given to Merope, the, the woman who brings Oedipus up as her own. And she says, she nursed the child my labor pains produced. Now that, that's being written by a man two and a half thousand years ago. How extraordinary is that? This physical, you know, part, men wouldn't have been going around witnessing women giving birth very often. You know, women were kept, especially upper class, people like Euripides, who was, and, and the women he knew, they were kept cloistered. He would never have seen, I imagine, some a woman giving birth, even you know, his wife, I would have imagined not. Um, and so he's, he still knows though, you know? And the idea of a woman um, nursing her own child, again, there's something so elemental about it. Merope hasn't given birth to this child, but she's producing milk for him. It's incredibly intimate and physical. And that's what happens when Euripides takes on the story. So there's no, there's no way we can say, oh, well, for ancient writers, the story is like this. And then, you know, revisionist writers come along in the 21st century and blah, blah, blah. It's just not true. You know, that it's Euripides is the person who you can look to and say, well, look right here in his text. He's got this incredible version of her and he's drawing on an, an ancient tradition um, of, uh, I mean, the, the, that monologue has an echo or an antecedent, I should say, um, in Stesichorus's version of this story, Stesichorus of Hymera, whose work has largely not survived, um, but magnificently, um, and this just could not be more perfect for Jocasta. Um, about 120 years ago, two French Egyptologists were um, taking, um, I say, trying to find neutral language for how um, removal of objects from uh, North African countries occurred. They were taking items from Egypt um, uh, to France because France was, they were, I know we all think about Howard Carter, but the French were mad for, for Egyptian artifacts and so on. And they had a new Institute of Egyptology in Lille at Lille University. And these two French Egyptologists took this mummy from Egypt back to Lille. And then for 70 years, I mean, it just couldn't be more perfect. For 70 years, they thought and looked and studied the mummy and they didn't spend very much time looking at the packaging material, the cartonnage, which is scrunched up papyrus, which keeps the mummy from kind of rattling in its cage, unless obviously it's possessed by um, some kind of dark force in a horror film, in which case you're on your own and cartonnage isn't gonna help you. But finally, after 70 years, so you know, in the 1970s, somebody sort of unrolled some of this paper and of papyrus and noticed that there was Greek written on it and the Greek turned out to be this big monologue of it must be Jocasta uh, from from Stesichorus so this is now known as the Leal Stesichorus and it's like if you were looking for a way of describing what happens to Jocasta hiding in plain sight it's like is there a better analogy than that I'm not sure there is it's amazing and the backstory in everybody's lives tells us so much more and yet I think what you're up against is human nature, that we do like to see things in, in black and white, and we do like to have someone on a pedestal and someone not. And you can't have two characters in a play on the, both on the pedestal. And there's something about, that's what we want. Um, Perhaps in drama, that's true, but certainly with something yeah. like Epic, of course, yeah. it, it isn't true. You know, with something yeah. like the Iliad, yeah. we want to see the story that there's the thing, it's, it's sure. Achilles that it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sing goddess of the wrath of Achilles is the opening line, but the play isn't called, the, yeah. the poem rather isn't called the Achilleid, the poem yeah. of Achilles, it's called the Iliad, the poem of the of Ilion, the poem of Troy. Yeah. So it, I, I think it just depends on the kind of story yeah. that we're telling. So yeah. once you start looking at, you're absolutely right, of course, when it's drama, uh, you know, we want that laser focus on a single character. Of course we do. Why wouldn't we? We don't want to see it, you know, diffused 
Otherwise, it'll be, be a different kind of play. Now, perhaps we'd be more likely to see playwrights do it, but certainly for ancient tragedians, not so much. But with epic or with love poetry, you know, you get these very different versions of stories. Um, hey, Nat Natalie, this is, this is um, I'm in despair because I want to go on and I wanted us to do the Amazons as well. I know, we've only just started, haven't we? How's this happened? <laughs> we've just started, but listen, we've got three and a half minutes. Um, okay. The Amazons chapter, you yep. start with a bunch, uh, the Amazons were, and then you quote. This is Hellenicus right. of Lesbos, I know this. That's right. <laughs> a bunch of gold, golden shielded, silver axed, man loving, boy killing women. Yes. Um, and then you go on to tell us otherwise. Um, I, I find them fascinating. They and, are fascinating. Are they? Yes, they absolutely are. And yeah. we're not the first people to be fascinated by them. Ancient Greek men were fascinated by them. Of all the mythological characters that you see on Bar's paintings, the most popular is Hercules, Heracles to the Greeks. Hercules is his Roman name. Um, the second most popular, Amazons. They were obsessed with them. And you have to assume there's something a little bit, um, I mean, pervy is probably overstating it, but these are women who are wearing tight garments, you know, tight trousers. Trousers are incredibly shocking to the Greeks um, because, you know, men wear tunics and women wear longer tunics. Um, and who wears trousers? Weird Eastern people. Um, so people from Persia, for example, which they can't, you know, this, this is very worrying to them. The Greeks have a, an extremely um, Greek-centric uh, attitude, Hellenocentric attitude to the world. And then here are the Amazons wearing these tight leggings and um, usually like a tunic top with um, incredible intricate geometric designs. They are magnificent warriors. There are three Amazonomikis to give them their Greek names, battles between Greek men and Amazon women. Um, and they are innovators in the art of war. So Penthesilea, who's the Amazon who fights Achilles at Troy, um, is credited by Pliny the Elder, I'm going to say, and I think I'm right, uh, with the invention of the, of the fighting axe. Um, so secularist is the word in Latin. So they are these incredible warrior women um, and they always fight in a gang, which I absolutely love about them because we're so used to this very individualistic mindset mm. of male warriors that we find in the Iliad and we'll find it in you know, the tragedians who, who, what is it, Aeschylus says, uh, his plays are slices from the banquet of Homer. Um, so the tragedians that follow that tradition, that it's very individualistic. Amazons always fight as a group. And, and, um, um, and yet, the term Amazon, if so, when, when referred to by, by the chattering classes, is not quite complementary, is it? Um, I mean, I think that's always the way with um, uh, gender terminology, like virago or um, any one of a number of terms. Of course, you're right. Even words like stepmother are usually preceded by wicked or ugly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's just the gendered nature of our language. So, no, I think it, it, it almost certainly isn't a, a compliment, but I'm going to make it one <laughs> if it kills And me. there are some. I mean, if, if, if you're a Helen of Troy, then that's, that's complimentary. You're, 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 you're OK, you're beautiful. And you're... Yeah, well, yes, if we, if we decide to value women by their looks, then yes, being Helen of Troy is a good one. I give you that. Um, we can't get to the other eight women, alas. Um, we've run out of time, um, but readers can in this terrific book which I've hugely enjoyed reading, um, Natalie. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for coming to the Swindon Festival of Literature online. I want you to come back um, live uh, to talk about anything. I will. The role of literature in life. Yeah, I will. Like. I'll come next time and um, we can do the other eight women. Oh, oh, you can listen to some of them on the radio series because I, I've done Medusa and I should know this because I only recorded yesterday. Hold on. <laughs> Medusa, Clytemnestra and Pandora. I did on the, the next series of the radio show, Natalie Haynes Stands Up for the Classics, which will be on Radio 4 from mid-May. So you can get it for free. I mean, not free because you paid a license fee, but thank you for paying your license fee. I and everyone else employed by the BBC appreciates it. And now you can listen to the shows if you would like. Um, Natalie, Swindon Festival of Literature says, thank you very much. Until we meet again, keep well. You too.